Hello, everybody, and let me give you a warm welcome to this batch of or shucks preview videos. If you are new to this format, these are not reviews. That's the main thing to take away. Shut up and sit down does these big long reviews. That's not what this video is. This video is Team Shut Up and Sit Down presenting a bunch of games to you as if you were at a convention and we're doing this on behalf of publishers who, due to COVID, are not able to demo their own games this year. This batch of videos we are calling Fun Month videos, games that could have fallen right out of Shut Up and Sit Down's recent Fun Month, light-hearted games that prioritize fun and action over uh, cubes and economy. And first up, we are looking at Cactus Town. Some pairings are just meant to be. Peanut butter and chocolate, tea and milk, and now the Wild West and uh, programming action selection. Um, you may have heard of a popular board game set in the Wild West called Cult Express, where people program their cowboys. Now we have another one in a ridiculously small box. This is Cactus Town by Second Gate Games. Uh, I really want to get across just how small this, this box is. What we've got here is a box that's smaller than some card game boxes, um, but it contains all of this. This is an asymmetrical programming game where one player, is. if you're playing just a two-player game, you've got some sheriffs trying to protect this town where each of these cards is a building. Um, the sheriff player is trying to protect the town from the outlaws who scatter around the edge, but we've got a four-player game set up, so things are also complicated by... Wait, I'll go through this again. The sheriffs are trying to capture and knock out the outlaws. The outlaws are trying to rob four randomly assigned buildings that only they know of. Um, they're gonna try and rob those buildings and then escape. Uh, the third player is gonna be the bounty hunters, who are these blue players over here. The blue bounty hunters partially want to steal some stuff. They need to steal a horse and get out of town, but they need to do so having knocked out and captured one of the outlaws. And our fourth player, we have the Can Can Dancer down here. Can Can Dancer has had a bad time. She's in debt. She's got something to prove for some reason. She needs to win several duels and pay off uh, several debts. And if she can do that, she will win. Uh, but she's acting alone. So she's like a Lone Ranger. Not literally. The Lone Ranger is in an expansion for Cactus Town. Um, there are several other asymmetric roles and if you take a peek at this setup card here you can see in the base box you've got the two player setup all these different three player setups but uh, if you're able to pick up the expansion for Cactus Town then there's all of these different um, three and four player setups that you can do. So how do you play? You're excited, your sheriffs want to get to knocking people out, your outlaws want to start robbing stuff, just calm down it's all very very simple. Whatever role you play in Cactus Town, you're going to have four action cards. And excellently, most of these are very simple. Actually, let's look at the sheriffs. They're marginally simpler. So everyone has a selection of action cards that let them do different things. But the tricky and excellent thing about Cactus Town is you're going to have to program this backwards. And you may recognize this mechanic from popular war game Forbidden Stars. Uh, but it's back here in a lovely little uh, party game format. So um, the first player, let's imagine it's the sheriff, is going to play the... Uh, action card that they're going to do last. Okay, so the sheriff might think, mm, okay, I'm pretty just going to try and arrest people after the madness of this turn. They're going to put that card somewhere. I'll just leave it here. Um, then the next player clockwise is going to pick an action that they're going to do last. Uh, maybe I'll try and steal something. And then the And so on and so forth, going round and round. Once everyone's put a card on the deck, you get back to the first player, who's then going to choose their second to last action. Then we're going to go again and again, all the way around. Everyone's going to do it one more time, picking their first action this round, then everyone will only have one action card left. You're gonna keep that, okay? Actually, it can add a special bonus um, in fights. But then you're gonna take this horrible stack of uh, actions with everyone guesstimating what they're gonna do and when they're gonna do it, and you're gonna work through it backwards from top to bottom, revealing, okay, first off, the Can Can Dancer is gonna have a duel. That wouldn't have, that doesn't make any sense. Uh, I did this randomly, of course, you saw me do it. That's not what would happen. What you might have is the Can Can Dancer declaring they're going to move, okay? Everyone has a run card and a sneak card uh, in their deck. Um, that's, uh, I just explained half the action in this game already. The run card lets you move all of your standees one space. So let's imagine the sheriff was moving, you could go bam, bam, bam. Um, then also you're going to reveal all of the buildings you've just run into. Sneak offers the same move, but when you sneak, let's imagine the outlaws sneak, sneaky sneaky outlaw, they're going to move one space orthogonally, but they don't reveal the card that they are in. They don't give that map information to themselves or anybody else. They don't even get to peek at the card, I think. 
No, you don't reveal it. It stays a mystery. Um, so this will continue with players nosing around town looking for stuff until players end up, uh, two standees from different sides end up in the same space. If you flip a card off the deck and it's a dual action, then you get to nominate any card in Cactus Town and say the players there are going to have a fight. Um, you don't even have to be in the building, which is a very important and excellent rule. Um, we've got uh, a sheriff and an outlaw here. Let's imagine that a fight was triggered here. Both sides will then roll a dice, uh, one dice for every standee they have in that space, and the winner will win. But, oh, I love this rule. Remember that card you didn't play? Well, depending on the quality of the card you didn't play, they all have strength symbols in the upper left-hand corner. And once per round, so once per resolution of all of these cards you put down, um, you can go, I'm gonna actually add this uh, to my dice roll and potentially win or lose. What then happens to the side that loses a fight um, depends on what faction you're playing. The sheriff just gets pushed all the way across town. I imagine they go like stumbling out of a window and fall on a horse's back and the horse rides away. Um, they can be pushed by the player that shot them one to three spaces and then they will reveal the card that they are on. It's worse news if the outlaws uh, lose a fight though. If the outlaws or the uh, bounty hunters lose a fight, they actually get knocked down, um, which enables them to be uh, la lassoed, that's not quite the right word, tied up basically, gagged, bound by the lawmakers such as the bounty hunters and the sheriff. And then that player can then pick that player up and attempt to take them to the jail. Similarly, uh, the bandits, if they manage to get to one of the locations they have to rob, they can then rob it, and then they receive a loot token, and then that bandit is trying to get to the edge of town and finally do another move action to leave town. As with all of the games in this preview, I have not played this game, but I can only guess it's going to be absolute carnage, with players simultaneously trying to not just uh, build this stack in the correct order of actions, like, I think I'm gonna move, then I'll probably need to trigger a fight, then I'll try and tie them up if I win the fight. But uh, not just trying to build this deck correctly, but trying to remember what card you put at the bottom and when it's going to happen. Um, if you've ever played Colts Express, uh, let me tell you, programming is an excellently funny mechanic. The word programming makes it sound like this is going to be some, uh, you know, sort of dry and mathematical process. It's not that at all. Programming is just absolute chaos. It's madness. It's carnage. Um, and maybe that's why it's best suited to, um, to Wild West games. I don't know. Um, one thing I will say that's really cute about this game, when you're dealing, so we've got our deck of blue cards to build Cactus Town here, and we use these red cards, uh, which sort of duplicates all of the blue cards, uh, to tell everybody, okay, you have to rob these four places, you owe money to these places, you're going to steal a horse from this place. But, the red cards is actually what's known as an advanced card deck, which is the same buildings, but many of them have special abilities, and even let players pick up tokens that they can spend at a later date for a little bonus. Um... You ignore that text if you're playing the game as I've set it up here, but if you want a more complicated game of Cactus Town, you just deal out 25 cards using the red cards, and then the blue cards are the ones that tell people where to rob. And that means that as you reveal cards with special abilities in town, players can use those abilities when they enter a building. That's quite a lot of rules, right? Quite a lot of tokens, quite a lot of modules, quite a lot of stuff happening. And I will remind you, this box, you could, I mean, you couldn't fit it in your trouser pocket, but I think I could, oh. Oh, look at that! Look at that! All of that board game! And it fits in your pocket. That's really quite something. Uh, and some really lovely art in this too. Really, really charming illustrations. Let's take a look at the next game. Okay, next up we are looking at Juicy Fruits from Capstone Games. Capstone Games' new family line, which is, so this is already kind of a contradiction. Capstone Games, known for making real hard, real mean games, and now we have a family line. How is this going to work? I'll tell you how it's going to work. It's going to work in a very cool way. Um, first off, I'm going to draw your attention to the enormous pile of wooden fruits we've got. That's another contradiction. How can a fruit be wooden? Don't ask questions, just enjoy the wooden fruits. Uh, what we have here is kind of a, a gentle and really innovative Euro game, okay? I've set this up for something like a one player game. Everyone's gonna get their personal player board that looks like this. And what you're gonna see is some baskets that you're gonna uh, sort of use to collect fruit. But also, all of these boats! Ah, oh, you've inherited a beautiful holiday island, but there's all these boats and they're saying, we want fruits and we won't leave. And until we leave, we're gonna take up space. Um, this is a game about basically delivering baskets of fruits to boats and also to local people um, who have their own ideas uh, as to how to improve the town. 
Now, we've noticed this from Capstone uh, recently, that this is a publisher who's taking an interest in stepping away from the kind of exploitative colonialist practices you often see in economic board games. I found it a really cool detail that these local people, who are predominantly people of colour, have their own ideas for how they want to improve the island, and it's, fulfilling, it's by fulfilling their ideas and giving them fruit that you can improve your island. So, how do you play? Well, uh, I'm going to direct your attention to your island here. On your turn, you are going to uh, move one of your ba fruit baskets. You're going to go fruit collecting. Uh, on your turn, you're going to slide a basket of fruit. So I might go, uh, and then I can't slide any further because there's an orange in the way. And because I moved this purple fruit, what is this purple fruit? This is the important stuff. It's a mangosteen. Goodness me, we're all learning some today, aren't we? So if I slide that mangosteen one space, that's going to earn me one mangosteen because I slid it one space. But now look, if I slide this banana, on my next turn, two spaces, that's gonna give me one, two bananas, because I slid it two spaces. Uh, then ultimately, as you, oh, I tell you what, look, look, I've got my manga scene and my banana, which means at the end of that turn, I could put this manga scene and this banana on this boat, which then brrr, drives away, getting me a point. No, no, uh, it's a big point tracker. And then look, I've got, I've freed up this extra space and I can slide this pomegranate a space there and get a pomegranate. And isn't that cool? Um, <laughs> Sorry, uh, I wasn't being facetious there. I think this sliding puzzle is really neat. I've never seen anything quite like this in a Euro game. And sure enough, it does fit that Capstone family badge of being like an interesting and difficult and, and, and unyielding Euro game. And yet one with, you know, like simple, very, very simple rules. Big chunky wooden fruit. I think this is super cool. Um, so we've got the scoring track. We've got the uh, your personal player board. And then we've got this shared board of development. So the way that this works is this is set up randomly at the start of each game and you've got different developments you can acquire um, at the sort of uh, community center that includes these five people and these five people have different costs. So this person up at the top, this she just loves limes and bananas and just by like handling, ha handling, handing her a lime and a banana, you can get the stuff at the top for one point, but the person at the bottom with richer, more banana-y desires uh, it's going to be five points if you acquire any of his ideas. And then all of these are relatively simple. You can get advanced collectors, but they're simple, but they go on your board taking up more room. And this is the fundamental puzzle of the game. It's trying to balance, you know, free, delivering to these boats to free up rooms to get more fruit with like your friends are taking up all the good business ideas. But so you want to get the business ideas early before your friends, but they then take up space on your board. Ah! Oh! The advanced collectors, um, when you move them, you gain, you can take that many, uh, in this case, bananas or limes, and then you get an extra one. So that's gonna really help you to acquire more bananas and limes. Um, you can also get ice cream uh, carts that go on your island, and when you move them, you can fulfill one of the, uh, the ice cream uh, sort of recipes on the bottom of the board, so that's cool. You can get things like an observatory, which is just gonna take up sp space, like most observatories do. Um, but they're worth points at the end of the game. And then there are these placeholder tiles that let you acquire giant things like a crocodile sanctuary, a toucan apartment complex. And they're gonna take up tons of space but give you tons of points. In my case, I can't even place these because all these boats are taking up room. Um, is that the entire game, Quins? I expected more from Capstone. Well, you are correct to do so. Allow me to introduce the advanced game. Ba -ba 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 -ba. This is the Juice Factory variant. So ordinarily, Juicy Fruits is a game with, just, with a very simple turn structure. It's just move a basket to collect fruit and then fulfill a recipe, either on a boat or in the town center. Um, when you're playing with the Juice Factory, you've got a three-step turn. It becomes move basket, then fulfill recipe, then you can optionally, let me just set up what a uh, two-player game would look like here. You can optionally pay to move one or both of your uh, counters down the kind of factory row of this juice shop. So for example, like to begin with, I can pay any fruit and I can skip ahead to juicier rewards later or I can s sling my hook down here and get a point. Um, and then you're sort of also trying to get to spaces before your opponents uh, to prevent them from acquiring stuff. So it's just, it's more considerations, a bit more nuance, a bit more complexity, a bit more ways to use your fruit. Um, that's the entire game. Uh, it didn't take me more than, uh, you know, 15 minutes to learn. It's relatively quick to set up. Um, it's juicy, it's colorful, it's, it's innovative. I, uh, I've, I've not been this excited by a fruit in a long time. And that's saying something, because I really do like fruits and I eat fruits a lot all of the time. 
Let's see what the next game is. Yeah. This is just really neat. I've heard good things about Long Shot the Dice Game and uh, very excited that I get to preview this. This is a roll and write adaptation of Long Shot, which is a game about betting on horses. Now, I'm thrilled uh, about this for two reasons. One, I really like roll and writes, but two, there seemed to be a bunch of like quite well regarded horse betting games um, that were sort of like before Shut Up and Sit Down's time and I'm very happy to uh, to be able to have a flutter now that they're kind of coming back in different forms. Uh, what we have here is a, we've set up long shot uh, for four players here with four sheets, but this game goes up to a, a stonking eight players. And it's a couple of firsts for me. First off, it's the first like well-regarded kind of party roll and write with players that are actually interacting. And on that note, it's also like, a much more interactive roll and write than I'm used to. Um, I should explain. So the way that this game works is first off, everyone's going to get uh, a player sheet and a pen and a card that gives them an initial bet on a couple of different horses and some other notches on their sheet. And then you're off to the races, uh, literally. So the active player, the first person is gonna roll a couple of dice, this gorgeous custom D8 and then a number. So this is just simply saying move horse number four two spaces and you'll notice that these horses have amazing custom illustrations and the beautiful wooden pieces. Um, we're then going to look at horse number four's sort of additional movement. You'll see the additional move for horse number four is two. So we're gonna move two, an extra space as well. Then all players are going to take an action according to this number, this number four. You can do a bunch of stuff with this. You can mark the number four uh, wherever it is on your little concession box here and every row or column of concessions you get is going to let you take any of these rewards from below. Or you see these two here, this lets you move a horse forward or backward. And this is where we get into the interactivity of this. This isn't just a game of watching the horses and then betting on them, which would make this more like other roll and rights you've played. This is also a game where players are going to be manipulating those horses drastically, pushing them forward, pulling them back, and, uh, and screwing with one another, basically. You can also use whatever number showed up on the D8 that round to buy a hat or a jersey. The hat, helmet, I should say, lets you place bets on horses after they've placed the no bet line at the end of the race. Whereas jerseys are going to let you mark an extra notch on a particular horse card so that whenever that horse moves, another horse is dragged with it. And because it's a horse betting game, no prizes for guessing that you can also use whatever number was rolled that round to place a bet on that horse of up to $3. Now all horses have their own odds that represent how many times your total bet across the whole game is going to be multiplied whether they come first, second, third, or if they pass the no bet line before the race is over. Anything else you can do with that action? Yeah, 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 there is. And I absolutely love this. You can, if it's my turn and I roll the horse number four, I can buy horse number four. Uh, all horses have their own price in the upper right hand corner. Owning a horse means you can make a tremendous amount of money if it comes first, second or third, which is obviously extra funny if all of your friends have bet on horse number four and they want it to win and now you own that horse. But also uh, owning a horse unlocks that horse's special ability for you. Just like real life, every horse has a unique power and you acquire that power uh, when you own it. I know lots about horses. At three points during the game, you can uh, spend one of these lucky horseshoes to treat the dice that was rolled that round as if it was any other kind of dice. You can also completely skip your turn to gain one of those wild actions back. I don't know why this tickles me so much, but it does. Uh, your money is represented by this sheaf of notes and then you rub it out and rewrite it every time you have a new total. I, I, just, I just find that really satisfying. Um, also, this long shot contains a different set of eight horse cards that you can mix and match or just play with entirely. So all the horses have different powers and presumably odds. Also, there's a solo mode. You can take on Canny Racer, uh, first name Roland, second name Wright. Uh, if you wanted to bet on some horses in the comfort of your own home in a way that probably won't cost you much money. Uh, that's it. That's the whole game. Not necessarily a complicated game, but then the best party games aren't. But nonetheless, I'm really impressed by this cute little small box full of absolutely gorgeous components. A roll and write kind of unlike what I've seen before. And frankly, every inch of this game makes me really excited to play it. I feel like I've been saying that a lot in the Shocks previews this year, but frankly, we've just... 
been asked to preview some really, really good games. So yeah, that's Long Shot the Dice Game, and uh, if the uh, initial reports and how fun it is are to be believed, a worthy kind of new addition to the line of Long Shot Games. And look, look how gorgeous these wooden horses are as they're racing around the track, round and round and round, round and round and round and round and... I'm gonna say it one more time. Look how nice that custom dice is. This is the nicest D8 I've ever seen. There, I said it, I went there. Stop the Train is a hidden role social deduction game where between four and six of you are on this big chunky train as it hurtles towards Paris armed with a bomb. So collectively, your job is to slow down the train, stopping it before it reaches its destination. But beware, because one of you on board is the saboteur, who wants nothing more than to watch it all crash and burn. The game will take place over a number of rounds and will end when one of two things happen. Either, hello, just a cat break. The game will last over any number of rounds until one of two things happen. Either the train crashes into Paris, at which point the saboteur wins and they win alone, or if this effect card deck is ever completely gone. If you get rid of all of the cards, that means the train has slowed to a halt and everyone wins. Or do they? They get a chance at winning because every player has a primary mission of stopping the train and a secondary objective to accomplish some other feat whilst on board the train. And we'll get to those a little later, but first I'll just say how the general turn structure works. On any given turn, the current player will take three cards from the effect deck, taking a look at them and choosing one to discard, putting it on this pile here. They'll then pass the cards to the player to their left, who gets the same option. They'll discard one and then play the other into the table. This one is full speed ahead, so we increase the train speed to 180 kilometers an hour, which means we will move six spaces forward on the next movement phase. Now, surely it's easy to work out who the saboteur is. They're the person that's always increasing the speed as much as possible. Not really, because there are loads of wrinkles in this board and in the player roles that will have people trying to do different things at different speeds. The most obvious one is that normally you'd want the train to go slowly, unless you are the speedster, who specifically wants the train to go as fast as possible down these slope sections in order to set the rail speed record. If they manage that, then they can win the game. And that's just one of the roles among many. There are loads of other things that are gonna cause problems on the train. These tunnels on the board allow people to exchange these permit to travel tokens, which will allow you to succeed and win the game even if you don't fulfill your secondary objective. But the ticket inspector wants to hoard them all for himself, so it's important that he keeps them over there, which might look really suspicious. Or, for example, the engineer wants to take this viaduct route to inspect it when you go around here. Again, might look suspicious, depends on how the game is going. And that's especially interesting because these bridges and this viaduct here allow the most juicy decision in all of the game. Who are you going to throw off the train? Whenever you're on here, you can take a vote and that person is then thrown off the train. If it's the saboteur, great, you've no longer got someone working against you. But it might be the stuntman clamoring to be voted for because he wins the game if he gets thrown off the train. Every player also gets dealt a couple of intervention cards which will help them succeed when they might fail or get their way when they want things to go that way. And that's basically all of Stop the Train. It plays in about 30 minutes and it's got a relatively light rules overhead. The complexity comes in which roles are in any given game and working out who's what as the train speeds forwards for a tense finish. Also, if you'll find your game a little easy, you can add in this freight train, which will always be pursuing the actual train, and if the two do meet, then that will cause a collision all in itself, so you've gotta keep accelerating, adding more friction into the decision-making process. And that is Stop the Train from Escape Plan Board Games, seats four to six players, and takes about half an hour. Prisma Arena is a fast-paced arena combat game where you and your friends will battle it out over the course of multiple evolving game sessions. Each time you fight, your personal hero will improve, gaining access to new techniques and abilities to make the game more exciting and complex. But before we get into the game proper, we should talk about Prisma Arena's most immediate and striking feature, its character creator. 
At the start of your first game, each player gets a hero, a bag, a locker, and a sticker sheet, where you can customise your appearance and the name of your hero, although some of the armour is only available once you've mastered the arena. So once you have named and kitted out your hero, we can set up the game. Here we've got an arena with obstacles inside of it, each player's squad opposite each other with their action dials and player cards, as well as some combo decks. The aim of the game is to bounce your opponent from the arena as many times as possible, as each time you do it, you'll score some points. The game is played over a number of rounds, and each round starts with checking advantage. Whichever player holds the advantage token can choose to hold it or spend it. If they hold it, then they will go second and their opponent will go first, but they get to keep the token. If they spend it, the other player gets the token and you get to go first. And then once you've decided who's going first, each player will take turns activating their characters. Each time you activate a character, you rotate their dial to represent the action you're taking. This first one is move. Moving is very straightforward. Once you've turned the dial to activate that character, you move them a number of spaces listed on their card. However, adjacent characters cannot move unless by some kind of special action. Those characters are considered to be grappling. Grappled characters probably want to get out of there pretty quickly, so let's talk about striking next. If you rotate the dial to strike, you will cause a melee hit on that opponent up to your force value. So in this case, this character will do two damage to the character they're currently next to. Any damage dealt will place hit tokens on that character's card, and if you fill it all the way to the top, they will be bounced. If you don't want to deal with getting grappled, then the third action will come in handy, blasting. That lets you fire at a character that is between two and four spaces away, again, dealing with your force in hits to their hit gauge. All that might sound a little restrictive, until the last piece of your toolkit, combos, come into play. Combo cards can be played on their own, rotating the dial to match the symbol and plopping it down and triggering the effect. This leap, for example, lets me move two to three spaces, ignoring grappling. But the twist here is that you can play combo cards on top of other actions so long as the symbols match, allowing you to chain together impressive maneuvers, leaping across the arena and doing lots of damage as you go. Now if you're on the receiving end of such a combo, then you might get bounced when your hit gauge fills all the way up from all that damage, and if that happens, you remove your figure from the arena, and players will score points based on how much damage they did. Each hit of a player's colour on a bounced character is worth one point, so in a two-player game, that's just going to be you. But with more players, the varied damage sources will give you a bunch of different points. But getting bounced is no biggie, because you're just going to come back next turn, ready to continue battling it out until someone gets 20 points, at which point the game will end, and one person will be the winner. But that's the basics of Prisma Arena. But now, we should probably talk about the more advanced stuff. In the second game, Advanced Training, you'll unlock your own personal special ability, as well as abilities for these little familiars that accompany you into the arena. The end of this game will grant you Prisma points, stored on the back of your player sheet. You'll gain them each time for participating, winning, or playing with one of the familiars for the first time. But most importantly, if you fill up the whole row, you will level up, popping a shard sticker here to signify the change and upgrading the armour of your character. And this sets the stage for your third training game, where players have access to these Prisma Power cards for the first time. You can gain these by getting 20 points at the end of a game, or by standing on the central square to power up. And either way, these cards are going to fundamentally change the way that you play your character, and they can be stored for future games. So you slip them back into your little bag, ready for next time. And that is basically all of Prisma Arena from Hub Games. It takes about half an hour to 60 minutes to play and is suitable for a very wide range of ages. Seriously, all the art in this game is incredibly approachable and nice and fun, and the rules complexity, the way it ramps up, is really nice for onboarding people into the genre. Next up, me and my giant Sporks Direct mug, it's not product placement, I swear, uh, are looking at Tumble Tumble, which is a kind of tactical, more thinky Jenga. What we've got here is, get out of here Tumble Tumble, I need all the space I can get. Several different sizes of wooden block. We have small, 
medium and large. And most importantly, the sawdust coming off these means that you get a cool puff effect. I'm gonna try and capture this on camera now. Tumble Tumble is trying to offer a dexterity game, but with a little more strategy than Jenga, because what you do in a, well, if you're not playing by yourself, you divide all the blocks up between the players, so everyone gets some large, some medium, some small, and then, I'll show you how this works. One player will begin by placing a block on the board, and everyone else will place their first block on the board, but after that, no blocks can touch the board, and in fact, you are of course trying to build this structure in a way that makes it more challenging for your opponent to place things. So, you know what? I'm just gonna cut straight to the close up and we're gonna experience me trying to play myself. I'm gonna be just trying to build this really in a really difficult way, so I screw up. Let's see how that goes. Okay, I'm not gonna lie, I'm like five moves in and I already hate myself. <laughs> Oh, me and my Sports Direct mug are already in trouble. Uh, not gonna lie, uh, now looking at the cover of Tumble Tumble and seeing the like weird abstract pile of blocks, I thought when I first unboxed this game that that was just like a weird abstract thing of the tower falling down. No, that's actually just what your tower's gonna look like when everyone's trying to be really horrible to each other. Let's use a heavy block to make this both more stable and more unstable. It's worth mention- oh god. Oh no. Oh no. Ah, 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 ah. Oh, that's a game loss. Uh, <laughs> I played myself, just like I promised. I'm just gonna put that back and pretend that didn't happen. It's worth mentioning, Tumble Tumble has a couple of advanced, uh, has a couple. One advanced mode, which even if that hadn't just touched the wood there, I still would have lost because the advanced mode of Tumble Tumble says that you lose if any of the bricks in the structure even move, let alone whether they touch the bottom. Uh, but I'm not gonna do that because I'm a worthy opponent to myself, if I do say so. Uh, myself, okay, this is giving me real anxiety. This is cool, this is fun, I'm enjoying myself, I'm having a great time. Why didn't I receive this game earlier in the pandemic? I'd have been perfectly happy just playing Tumble Tumble by myself, alone. He's heavy block, and also there is like, ah! Sports Direct Mug. You're my only bomb in these trying times. That's Tumble Tumble. That's my Sports Direct Mug. That's pretty good. I <laughs> quite enjoyed that. Let's see what the next game is. If you've ever wanted to sell a crossbow from God to an orc, then Rock Manor Games has got you covered with Merchants of Magic, a roll and write game in which you are running your very own item shop, rolling these dice each round to get resources, then spending those resources to make items which you sell to adventurers for profit. The player with the most money at the end of the game will be the winner. At the start of the game, each player takes a pencil and a sheet, and we plop down these potions and dice on the table. Then each player takes some orders that they're ready to fulfill, and a personal adventurer who's going to be their star customer. And then the game begins proper. We play over ten rounds, and each round starts by rolling these dice. Once you've rolled the dice, you will note down each of the numbers available in their respective rows. So for example, we've got a 3 here on the d6, a 2 on the d8, a 6 on the d10, and a 6 on the d12. Those are the numbers we can then use to fill in these boxes in their corresponding columns. For example, here this ring needs a 2 or higher on the steel red dice, so we could fill in that box no problem. If you ever fill in a whole row, then you can circle the coin on the left and take a potion, which will let you increase or decrease a die by one per potion spent. On the other side, we have enchantments and charms. These need lower values than what's available on the dice. And if you fill in both of those, you'll get the coin and the potion as normal. But often combining the two will let you fill in these orders. For example, if I can make crossbows, and if I've got the Of the Elves enchantment, I can make this Crossbow of the Elves order, which will give me three coins at the end of the game. That's three points, and I'll get a new order to go here, and now I need to make a Fiery Grimoire, which means I need to fill in the Fiery Row and the Grimoire Row. Alongside this, you also have an adventurer who needs a specific set of things, and each time you fill in one of those, you can cross off these boxes at the bottom, which will get you three coins, or a random circle to fill in, or any circle and the coin 
things on that adventurer, so they're very useful to do as well. You've also got charms over here, which will improve your shop, and you can always take an extra dice. You're normally only allowed two. You can have three if you fill in these boxes, but they cost potions as the game goes on. There's also opportunities for mastery. These two cards over here will give the player that achieves them gold bonuses at the end of the game. This one, for example, needs you to mark six columns in the leather, the furthest right material column on your board. If you do that, you'll get eight coins. And then at the end of a turn, once players have fulfilled their goals and achieved their orders and decided they've done all they can for the round, the orders rotate round the table, so you get a new one on the end and the other player gets the furthest on yours. So you can always see what's coming when adventurers aren't fulfilled, but what if a player takes it off the table before you? And that is basically all of Merchants of Magic, a roll and write game about running your very own item shop. It can be played with up to eight players or even solo with some optional challenges in the box as well. Up next, we've got a party game for you. Woo! Party! Party! This is uh, Anchorman, The Legend of Ron Burgundy, the game put out by Barry and Jason Games and Entertainment. And what we have here is kind of a Mad Lib style situation. Um, we have got, more importantly, a little uh, Sex Panther uh, egg timer. We have got uh, some metal player boards, we're going to talk more about them later, and we have so many magnetic words. If you, it's, I don't know if you and your housemates enjoy doing that magnetic poetry on your fridge, but if you do, it might be worth buying this game just to get a million words. I haven't even punched them all out. This is, what you've got on here is six of the 15 sheets of funny words that this game comes with. So, this being a fun time party game, it doesn't really matter who wins, which is something that the manual basically acknowledges. You end this game when you just want to, which is the correct time to end a party game. Um, but when you get points, you are going to be sticking these lovely Anchorman uh, magnetic symbols onto your personal player board, and you're going to be using the reverse of your metal personal player board during the round. So each round, someone is going to be the news anchor who has to read a news story off the teleprompter, which is this lovely thing. Everyone is going to get a handful of words of each different type. There's verbs and other kinds of verbs, there's nouns uh, in front of them, and then they're also going to receive a piece of paper that's going to go onto the back of their board and then is held there by magnetic words, which is super cool. Everyone has exactly 60 seconds on the Sex Panther timer in order to do that, and accidentally the panther sort of looks around uh, as it's rotating, but we're not going to have that bothering us for the rest of the preview. And when the timer goes off, everyone then hands in their filled out uh, teleprompter panels and you get something like this. This is what a five player game would look like. If you imagine me reading the teleprompter and uh, and these are, this this is what I now have to read as a news anchor. And every time that I break, which and it's up to your group to decide what that means, but it's basically every time I smile or laugh or even hesitate, if you're being particularly cruel, the person whose sheet I hesitated on is gonna get a point. But if I go through the whole thing cleanly, uh, I get a point. Also, whether I win or lose, I'm going to pick my favourite story to give an additional point to. So, I made these four sheets, so this isn't quite fair because I know what's coming, but let me show you how this works. Hey wet spots, have you been waiting for the perfect life goal? Well, Channel 4's expert is here after the break to show you how eroticizing wolf-dog hybrids can help with your blood oath. This weekend marks the 14th anniversary of the exploding of military-grade condoms. Come out early and make sure to bring your gravy. This dog's crutchal region may be worse than its bowel movement, but not according to animal control services who say the dog has been pooping missing toes for weeks. Are slimy handshakes ruining your gentleman lover? The health team says to try disinfecting them with ghosts. I got through all of that without laughing at all, but that's because I'm a stony pro and also because I wrote the jokes, so that wasn't totally fair. Uh, I think this is a lovely little production. Uh, licensed games these days just do seem to be getting nicer and nicer in terms of the bits you get in the box. Uh, there's a lot, oh, I, sh I almost forgot, I almost forgot to mention. The game comes with this deck of uh, tarot, <laughs> tarot sized uh, whammy cards that you can optionally play with that are going to add a little extra twist to each round, like the host being able to give an extra point to someone or one of the players uh, from Anchor Man just getting a point because it's a party game after all and who needs things to be fair? Not me. Uh, a cute little thing this. Uh, let's see what the next game is.
Sellouts from publishers Bad Kerning is a game about being dodgy travelling salespeople trying your best to get your friends to buy your dodgy products. At the start of the game each player will take a hand of product and feature cards and one player will become the customer. That customer will have a problem. This one is that that customer keeps getting their leg caught in a bear trap. Each player then uses the cards in their hand to come up with an inventive solution to their problem, as well as dealing an extra feature in there to make things a little bit interesting. Then, the customer will choose which player thinks deserves their one dollar. Play continues around the table until each player has been the customer three times, at which point the game will end, and the player who has the most dollars is the winner. And if you wanted a much smaller version of the game, then you can get the Travelling Salesman Edition, a tiny little deck of cards that will fit in your back pocket when you go to the pub. And that is all of Sellouts from Publishers Bad Kerning Games. Battle Bears is a light and breezy battle royale game where players will be charging around this big open map, trying their best to take each other out before they get swamped by a swarm of pink huggable bears. If you ever get surrounded by them, it might just be game over, and any players that get eliminated join that swarm. It's nice and simple as well. You take two actions on your go from a very simple list. You can move, you can attack, you can use an item or ability, or you can rearm, rearrange, and reload. Moving is very simple. You just take your token and move it up to the number of spaces dictated by the weight your character is carrying. If you're laden with loot, you're going to move a lot slower. And note that some of these spaces are also impassable, such as these cliffs and lava spaces. And some are just tricky to pass through, like these forests. So paying attention to the terrain is going to be important. The second thing you can do is to attack an opponent, tracing a line of sight between you and them and using a weapon by exhausting it to attack them, hopefully dealing some damage unless they might have armour to protect themselves. Your third option is to use an item like this Easy Cheese or Soul's Bane, using their effects to take an advantage. Each character also has a unique ability, so this is the time to invoke those as well by burning gas cards from your hand. The very last thing you can do is to reload, which involves flipping all of your exhausted cards back to their face-up side, ready to use again, as well as adding any new cards from your hand into your roster, so I could equip this armour here. And then that will be your turn once you've done two of those five actions. But then there's one more thing to do, and that's advancing the swarm. The active player will place one of these tokens either next to an existing one or next to the edges of the board. These represent the swarm descending, and if a player ever ends their turn surrounded, they'll take three damage. Crucially, if a player ever gets reduced to zero health, they have been taken by the swarm and will flip their player board over to this side and add a new huggable token where they once stood. But this time, these ones are active and will actively try and speed up the end of the game by placing two of these tokens a turn, as well as actively gunning for any players that might be alive. If they can take out everyone at the same time, or if they fill the board with these tokens, they instantly win the game as a team. And that's Battle Bears, published by Oom Games and designed by Brendan McCaskill and Jonathan Thwaites with art by Dan Wang. It looks pretty light, breezy, and has a variety of different game modes to sample, like Free For All, Deathmatch, and King of the Windmill. And that is the end of this instalment of Or Shucks Previews. If you're watching this video anywhere between the 16th and 18th of October, well, surprise, surprise, we've got a convention, and it's happening right now. We've got a ton of fantastic guests over the weekend, loads of publishers from all around the world showing off their games, free Tabletopia membership for the entire weekend, new merch designed by me and Matt, and a store where you can access all of these lovely games at a slightly reduced price that will benefit the publishers and us as well, which is neat. Uh, if that is not your cup of tea, then don't worry, we've got a whole YouTube channel of excellent content that you can check out right now, as well as other Orshucks previews if those tickle your fancy as well. Have a lovely day!